Okay, an Ivy Bridge update. So sadly, it seems that my ASRock Z77 OC Formula motherboard, which has served me for a very long time, is now dead. Or it well, it seems that it's dead. Uh, I used that particular motherboard for many Ivy Bridge 3770K top scores and like multiple air and water cooling tests with uh, Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge CPUs and after like last spring or last winter it stopped working for some uh, unknown reason I got it to work for a few times when I put the motherboard in an oven which I uh, made a video about like in last July but after that the board really doesn't work anymore in uh, first attempts I was able to post the motherboard when I heated the PCH area of the motherboard like uh, when the chipset was too cool, nothing happened when I pressed the power button on the motherboard. But when I used like a heat gun towards the chipset heatsink, I was actually able to turn on the motherboard and use it like normally or as normal. But now it doesn't work at all. So nothing just happens when I press the power, power button on the motherboard. Uh, I even tried to short the, uh, the socket occupied pin on the motherboard to a ground point. The same thing what we do when we want to run like a 9th generation CPU or 8th generation CPU on a Z170 or a Z270 based motherboard. That same exact point is on this motherboard as well, like it's on many other uh, like it's on many other motherboard models. So that same modding point uh, is between the third or between the second and third full-length PCI Express slot over here. I actually shorted or I did short that particular socket occupied pin to ground but it didn't help at all. So it seems that the issue with this particular motherboard has to be somewhere around the chipset. Maybe some of the solder balls have cracked underneath the chipset so it no longer works. So maybe there is like a way to get the motherboard back working but I'm not really sure that do I want to mess around with this particular motherboard anymore. So I'm actually trying to sell the motherboard in a local forum as repairs. So if someone wants to try or if someone wants to give an attempt on repairing this motherboard then I can happily just keep the motherboard away because I because I was talking with other users on HWB forums and similar and it seems that the uh, this particular motherboard model is quite fragile so it doesn't last that long and they seem to die very easily so I actually thought about replacing the Z77 motherboard altogether to uh, to another one if you ask me, there aren't that many like very good motherboard models for Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge overclocking. Ivy Bridge is much harder territory because with Ivy Bridge CPUs we have to go much colder than with Sandy Bridge CPUs when talking about sub zero overclocking, I mean, and the memory frequency range is much much higher with Ivy Bridge CPUs compared to Sandy Bridge. With Sandy Bridge CPUs you are mostly you are mostly limited between like 2133 to 2300 megahertz memory wise. So usually you run memories at around like 2133 to 2200, but it depends on your kit of course. So when talking about like the best motherboards for Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge overclocking like combined, I would name like three models. So the ASRock Z77 OC Formula, the Gigabyte Z77X UP7 and the Maximus 5 Extreme from Asus. I have really liked this board. It's very good for CPU and memory overclocking with all of the CPUs I've tested so far. But if it doesn't last that long, if it has some weird like death issues, that's not very good either. The uh, Gigabyte board, so the uh, Z77 XUP7, it has ridiculous VRM for CPU, so 32 power phases. So it's like a quadrupled 8 phase. For CPU overclocking, that board was actually quite good. It managed to do CPU Z validation up to like 7.186 by Dinos22 from Australia in like spring of 2013. For memory, it doesn't seem to be as good, I mean, compared to the ASRock board or the Asus Maxima, uh, Maximus 5 Extreme. So I thought about getting the Asus Maximus 5 Extreme because there was another friendly user at our local uh, forum here in Finland 
and he offered me to lend the Wapa board. So I thought about getting it and trying it out myself. And not just that, I actually purchased a brand new 3770K CPU recently, which has also been pre tested the same way as the 4790K. So uh, I only ever had one 3770K, I think, in my whole like, well, overclocking, overclocking career, if you can call it that. So I got that CPU in like the summer of 2018, and it was a record capable CPU from the get go because I purchased that CPU based on a batch number. So the batch of the now dead CPU or now dead 3770K that did the top score in Cinebench R11.5, R15, Geekbench 3 and W Prime 1024M. It was three, hold on a minute. It was three to 18C 043. So the three to 18 is a very famous batch. So that's why I, well, I accidentally, I noticed it on eBay. So I just wanted to try my luck. I purchased this CPU and it was very awesome from the get go. On water cooling, I think it was able to do like five gigahertz Cinebench R15 with 1.2 something volts. And on LN2, I could validate, I think like 7,040 megahertz. So that was like single core thing, but it was a CPU Z validation. On LN2, when talking about multi-threaded benchmarking, I was first limited at 6.4 something for Cinebench and similar. And then comes the uh, interesting part. Back then in 2012 and 2013, when deleting was a new thing, many people wanted to try to delete the Ivy Bridge CPUs, especially the daily users. But for extreme overclocking, the users who tried deleting they actually got worse results than before deleting. Many people said that the Intel paste is the best thing ever for LN2 overclocking because it can get better uh, end result than the uh, third party thermal paste. Like, well, back then we mostly used Jelly Solutions GC Extreme. Cryonaut wasn't still out there on the market, uh, uh, nor was KPX. My personal opinion about that whole thing, that why would deleting make your LN2 overclock worse, is that people actually cracked their thermal paste. That's the only uh, real like explanation I can think of. Only the Bauer managed to get a better score on LN2, before, I mean after deleting. But like 90% of the users had worse end result after deleting. But I'm, I am really, I am pretty much certain about the thermal paste cracking because when Skylake was released, all of the users out there in the community, they had to learn how to mount the CPU correctly without uh, cracking the thermal paste when going on LN2. So it was like a very long learning process for every extreme overclocker out there in the world. So that's, that's my only real life explanation because that same thing happened to me, what happened to Roman or De Bauer. This particular CPU, when I tried it on LN2 first, I mean, without deleting, the uh, maximum frequency in Cinebench and similar was like 6.4 something. So like 6.42, somewhere between like 6.4 and 6.45. But when I deleted and I used KPX thermal paste, and I, of course, I applied a lot of it, like more than you would normally use for air or water use, the multi-threaded maximum frequency went up by 100 to 200 megahertz. W prime, I could do 32M almost at like 6.7 gigahertz. The 1024M was 6.6 .6 something, and CD bench is like up to like 6.55. So I can definitely say that deleting is worth it for LN2 use on Ivy Bridge. It has to be about the thermal paste cracking. And nowadays we have so good thermal pastes out there on the market like KPX and Cryonaut and so on. So this brand new 3770K is the same batch as the dead one. So this was 3218C043. And this brand new one, let's take a look at it. I haven't tried it yet. This new one is 3218C109. It has been deleted already, 
So now many people would say that oh, it's been ruined already for LN2 use, but no, I am certain that it will be very very good on LN2 if you mount the CPU correctly and you use good thermal paste and a lot of it. So this CPU should be able to do at least 5.1 in Silibens R15 on water, maybe 5.2. So let's give it a go because many of the Ivy Bridge CPUs are very very bad on water cooling as well, like just 4.3 or 4.5. So let's give it a go. Let's forget about the ASRock Z770 OC formula. I tried many days to check if I could it, if I could get it working, but it just doesn't give any life anymore. If I had some proper BGA soldering equipment, I could try to reball the chipset area, but it's quite hard. You need like a professional uh, chipset. I mean professional BGA soldering equipment to do that or to attempt that. So I think it was just easier to maybe get rid of that particular motherboard completely and swap to another one. So I wanted to try the Maximus 5 Extreme because it was very good for overclocking for on I mean with both Ivy Bridge and Sandy Bridge CPUs. If you look at the top scores on HW Pot, the top scores are mostly Maximus 5 Extreme and ASRock C77 OC formula. So let's put the motherboard to the side and also the CPUs and let's check what is inside this box. So on, on the contrary to what you are seeing at the moment in front of the camera, this is not uh, Rampage 5 Extreme or Rampage 5 Edition 10. This is an Ivy Bridge CPU that is just stored in this x99 motherboard packaging. So this was actually loaned to me by another user on our Finnish IOTech uh, website forum, but I think I can uh, purchase this board uh, from him uh, completely uh, as he has been getting rid of many components recently. So let's check this motherboard out and do, I think I thought about doing like uh, this whole uh, conversation and motherboard overview video separately and let's do the actual overclocking tests in a separate video. So let's take the motherboard out. So no accessories whatsoever, but we don't really need them. The only useful accessory for overclocking purposes is the OC key. But as we don't do any 3D, we don't really need it. So let's put that to the side. So that's the board itself. Let's just go through the main features quickly, especially from overclocking perspective, and then just compare the two boards side by side to note the key differences between the two. So the first thing you can easily note from the Maximus 5 Extreme is the PCI Express layout for multi-GPU configurations. Yes, the board does support various multi-GPU configurations, including three-way and four-way SLI. So the Maximus 5 Extreme does have the PLX chip on the motherboard's PCB that adds extra PCI Express lanes to the motherboard in order to run those uh, higher multi-GPU multi -GPU configurations like the freeway and four-way SLI. As NVIDIA graphics cards, they do require at least eight lanes per graphics card to run. The PLX chip should reside underneath this small heatsink over here Although there's another one uh, between the third and fourth red colored PCI Express slot over here. The uh, PLX chip also has a small uh, negative side. It adds a little bit of extra latency. So in some cases, especially if you only run one graphics card, it's actually a small minus. So if we compare the two boards side by side uh, in this part, so uh, the ASRock board doesn't have that PLX chip on the board, which is one of the reasons the board was much cheaper than the Maximus 5 Extreme back in the day. So on the ASRock motherboard, if you want to run single graphics card, it will be just X16 in the top slot over here. Two cards, X8, X8, and three cards, X8, X4, X4. So you cannot run more than two-way SLI on the ASRock board, but you can run three-way Crossfire X. On the Asus motherboard, you can run single card at X16, two cards at X16, X16, 
free cards or free uh, freeway SLI or freeway Crossfire X doesn't matter X16 X16 X8 and four cards X16 X8 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 so uh, if you only run a single graphics card the Astro board is actually better because here it will be X16 without the extra latency of the PLX chip but over here it will be X16 with the extra latency of the PLX chip if you run two cards in SLI, I think the situation is kind of neutral. So here it will be X8, X8 without the extra latency, but here it will be X16, X16, but with the extra latency of the PLX chip. A small minus on the Maximus 5 Extreme compared to Rampage 4 Extreme, uh, for example, is that both of the X16 slots uh, are so close together. So these two are the X16 slots. These are X8. So the most preferable configuration or layout for two graphics card operation would be like a larger gap between the graphics cards themselves. So the most suitable layout would be X16 over here and X16 over here. So they will so that there would be like a large gap between the two graphics cards for easier cooling and so on. But those are the differences. If you only run one graphics card, the Astro board is better because there's absolutely no need for the PLX chip. The only really requirement for the PLX chip is, or where you can actually utilize it, is if you want to run two cards or more, but preferably three, way, three or four graphics cards. Nowadays, it doesn't matter as we don't run 3D on these older platforms anymore. So nowadays this is only about 2D, so I will be just running a simple graphics card in the last PC Express slot and that's it. So let's put the Astro board to the side once again. The VRM part should be quite the same on both of the boards. The power connectors are the same, so 8 plus 4 pin. And I think the overall like VRM structure should be quite the same, like no big differences between the two. All of the LJ1155 motherboards, they should have four memory slots, so two memory slots per channel. Uh, on like X79 motherboards, there are some motherboards that had only one memory slot per channel, like Rampage 4 Formula and the Gigabyte X79 UD7. Uh, in theory, that's a better design because then the memory, memory sticks themselves would be closer to the IMC but when it comes to DDR3, it doesn't give that kind of advantage compared to what we have seen today with DDR4 Samsung B die based sticks. Then uh, some of the main features of the Maximus 5 Extreme. Let's look at this part first. Let's zoom in. So the main feature of the Maximus 5 Extreme as well as the Rampage 4 Extreme, which was the flagship motherboard for the X79 socket in the early days. So for the Sandy Bridge E CPUs was the OC key, which I already mentioned. So the OC key is like a fancy dongle you put between the graphics card and the monitor. The OC key adds like an extra overlay on the, moni on the monitor, but it doesn't use any of the system's resources. So you can use the OC key to monitor various things and even make settings on the fly, the same way as the OC panel works nowadays. So the OC key is kind of better version of the OC panel. Many of the features that reside on this motherboard and in the OC key still exist in the OC panel of today. OC panel was originally introduced with the Maximus 6 Extreme in 2013 and it has been around since then. So here is the OC key uh, header. So you just connect the OC key to the graphics card you connect the monitor to the OC key and there's a wire coming from the OC key to this board over here so that you can actually make some changes to the system using that OC key function. That's a su supplementary 6-pin power connector for the PC Express slots. So if you use two cards or more, that should be plugged in. Now this white 4-pin connector over here, that this is not a fan connector. On the Rampage 4 Extreme, that connector was a supplementary floppy 4-pin power connector for the memory slots. So if you ran 4 or 8 memory sticks with high overclocks and high voltage, you could add some 
uh, extra power for those memory slots. But on the Maximus 5 Extreme, based on the information around of the, I mean from the internet, this is actually a 4-pin uh, floppy power connector for the back I.O. ports and it sounds a bit weird. Why would you need a supplementary power connector for the rear I.O. ports? Well, that's how the manual says, but that sounds a bit weird. The memory, like, it sounds more realistic to have like an extra power connector for the memory, but rear I.O. ports, the, I mean the amount of power they require, it shouldn't really vary that much. So it sounds a bit weird. So you don't really have to connect this in, I'm pretty sure. Then uh, let's look at the other important part of the board. So over here, so we have the start and reset buttons. We have the PCI Express slot disable switches. So if one of the graphics cards goes bad, you can just disable them one by one and find out what, what of which of the graphics cards is giving you issues. 24 pin, then we have all of the voltage measurement pads over here. So we have both the pads as well as the uh, uh, connectors to connect two in two pin or two wire connectors. And you can then just connect the multimeter probe to the wire and continuously monitor the desired voltage. LN2 mode plus slow mode switch. Then we have two hot wire connectors. So you can use these to control up to maximum of two graphics cards at the same time. So you just, so the VGA hot wire does the same thing as doing uh, uh, VR mods on graphics cards. So uh, potentiometer mods. So you can, so if you connect these two pin headers to the mod points on the graphics card, you can monitor and adjust the V core, the memory and the PLL voltage of the graphics card. So it's kind of cool and it still exists even today in the OC panel. So uh, the cool thing about the OC panel is that nowadays it's a separate device that stays on continuously. So uh, in that regard it's much better and more convenient to use. So uh, this is kind of cool and this kind of solution could even work in some kind of a daily situation. These four I2C pins over here, they are also tied a little bit to the, hot, to the VGA hotwire setting. So if you connect like one of these to the I2C points on the graphics card, for example a reference 7970, you can actually make direct changes with the Asus Turbo V software to the graphics card, like set a low line calibration setting or even disable the overcurrent protection of the graphics card altogether. There are, that's kind of clumsy in some ways because I actually killed one reference 7970 back in the day because you can accidentally make changes to the graphics card which you only meant to be done on the CPU. So that's why it's a little bit risky to uh, use these on the graphics card. So I personally prefer to keep the modifications of the graphics card separate from the rest of the system. So that is why I actually prefer like the VR mods more or an e-power mod compared to something like this. But this is a very cool innovation by uh, Shamino like back in the day. And they still, all of these features, they still exist today in the OC panel. That should be a go button, I think. And debug LED and here, here at the SATA area, we have the sub-zero sense. So this port over here, it has two K-type thermocouple ports. So you can connect two K-type thermocouple probes to this uh, port over here, and you can just co uh, monitor and follow like two temperatures. So like a CPU port and a graphics card port. It's quite cool, but uh, it's a little bit clumsy again because you have to use the OC key, the overlay on the, uh, on the monitor to follow the temperatures of those uh, uh, pots or whatever you are trying to measure. So uh, it's of course nice that you have this feature without extra cost, but I think it's quite, uh, I think it's quite clumsy. So a really good like third party high quality thermometer is always better than something like this. So that's why I will not be using this one myself. Something like a Fluke 52.2 or a 10 mass meter which I've been using for ages is better than that. 
But again, it's a very cool innovation and it still exists in the OC panel. But even with the OC panel, I think it's not as accurate as like a really good thermometer like the Fluke 52.2. But of course, if you can get something like that for free with the motherboard itself, it's of course a very nice thing because like very good high-end thermometers, they aren't cheap. Like a Fluke 52.2 is like 300 euros new. So that's why it's kind of cool to have something like this present on the motherboard. Here is a BIOS switch. We have, the motherboard does have two removable BIOS chips. There are eight SATA ports. These black ones are SATA 2 and these are SATA 3. Not sure if all of them are from the Z77 chipset. Maybe these six are from the chipset and these two are as media, but I'm not fully sure, but could be. So uh, yeah, those are the main features. Let's look at the rear I.O. quickly. So. Here at the rear I.O. we have eight USB ports. These blue colored ones are USB 3. These are USB 2. The white colored one is the ROG, like the BIOS flashback port. So if you want to use the, if you want to use the BIOS flashback feature, just connect an empty FAT32 USB stick into this port over here. Have the BIOS file named correctly, corresponding with the board. So in this case, like M5 E dot cap or dot ROM. Bus reset button, the ROG connect button over there, LAN port, SPD out, HDMI display port, PS2 combo port, 7.1 audio, and this is the Thunderbolt port, which should be like a mini display port at the same time. So yeah, so those are the main features of this particular motherboard. So will be very interesting to test that one out. So I will see how well the new 3770K will do on this board. I actually got a, a quite funny uh, socket cover with this board. So that, that's actually a 2500K in the CPU socket at the moment. But yeah, so let me know what you think. Drop a comment down below if you uh, have any questions about my upcoming tests. But uh, if you like to see like one, some of these like old flagship uh, motherboards, then please give a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I have more of these videos coming up. And again, leave a comment down below if you have any questions or comments about this video. And thanks for watching once again if you like this. And I will see you in the part two where we will actually try to overclock the 3770K.